Thank you so much for being here. Maybe I can shed some light on why I use calcium and magnesium a lot of it, very often, when, and of course the why, and I hope that I can explain it in such a way as well as Rick L did when he opened my eyes to these fabulous, fabulous components that can be supplemented to our orchids, even if we do have a balanced fertilizer. Rick L was a big game changer for me when it came to growing orchids in a pot. While I was growing orchids in the trees, I let Mother Nature take care of it. My challenges began when I wanted to have orchids in a hemisphere that is not conducive to growing in trees, and I had to put them in pots. And that is where Rick L will always be a part of my orchid growing journey and I have to give him all the credit. And I hope that what he has taught me, I can do justice because I'm a layman, laywoman. I don't understand many of these components. You have to spoon feed me the details and dilute it in such a way that my mind can absorb it and then apply it. I always need to figure things out with logic. So this is not like an in-depth discussion as to the chemistry or the biology behind calcium and magnesium as pertaining to orchids, but more why do I use it and when do I use it based on what these two different components do to the orchids. But I can't do that without explaining calcium on its own and magnesium on its own in order then to bring it together to CalMag as we normally like to do our applications. So here's the calcium nitrate that I have and it is a white powder like granules, shards, they look like little crystals and for me one pinch like this is approximately 60 to 70 parts per million in a 10 liter bucket of reverse osmosis water. So that's my measurement. I take a pinch and it works out to 60 parts per million, sometimes 70, depending if my pinch is a little heavy handed and I keep it in its original container. In two years, I have gone through one and a half containers of calcium nitrate. But what is this stuff? Well, basically, I'm going to go back and refer to my notes so I don't fumble my way through this because then it becomes even more difficult to listen to. <laughs> so just like with us humans and we use calcium for healthy and strong bones, orchids use calcium in much the same way to build cell walls, amongst other things. It is absorbed through the root tips, pulled through the xylem, during the transpiration process, which then transports the calcium from the roots to the leaves and any newly growing part of the orchid. So when people say calcium is immobile, and I just said that it is pulled through the xylem, it sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. At the beginning, calcium is mobile, but once it is in place and where the orchid, so to speak, wants the calcium, or needs it most, calcium becomes immobile and will not be translocated from an older part of the orchid to where it may be needed in the future. I'm hoping that makes sense. If not, bear with me, we'll get to that. So very important, the priority of the orchid is for new growths and new roots. And that is where the major concentration of calcium accumulation will be pulled to because that is the future of the orchid. It cannot pull from the leaves, that is the immobile part of calcium. That is why we also see any deficiency of calcium. It'll become more obvious at the most rapidly expanding tissue, like the growths and new leaves as they develop. Capnias are the type of orchids most susceptible to calcium deficiency, and it is very easy to misidentify calcium deficiency and think it is black rot. But unless the symptoms show signs of being wet or oozy, chances are it is not black rot, but calcium deficiency. Calcium deficient orchids are, on the other hand, more prone to black rot and susceptible to infection by the water molds that cause black rot. So a deficient orchid will be more prone to black rot because it is weaker and the molds can take hold. But the symptoms differ seeing as one is a dry failing of a new growth, blackening of leaf tips, while the rot symptoms are wet and oozy and squishy and soft to the touch. 
you can feel the tissue has declined and has broken down. Whereas a calcium deficient symptom is more dry. You can touch the area and it's much drier. It's just deteriorated because there is nothing there to build the cell walls. And this is the magnesium I took out of its container. These are like granules as well, but they look a little bit more like crystals, really proper crystals in baguette shapes. Beautiful for a ring, a facet, a setting. <laughs> but this is Epsom salts, magnesium. It is used by the orchids to produce chlorophyll, which in turn is used for photosynthesis as well as other metabolic processes. So like calcium, Magnesium is also absorbed through the roots and transported by the xylem during the normal transpiration. But unlike calcium, magnesium can be transferred and transported within the orchid to where it is needed. And usually new growths and leaves take priority. So that is where the orchid will focus its energy resources. If there is a magnesium deficiency, it won't affect the new growths per se, not like a calcium deficient orchid would, but in a magnesium deficient orchid, the oldest leaves will show signs of mottling, which appears as light green blotches between the natural green color of the leaf. It can also appear as a reddish tinge on the leaves, which is not to be mistaken for too much light and anthocyanin. You will more often than not see the magnesium deficient orchid show the red tinges when the orchid has gotten too cold. Very similar symptoms and from a visual point of view to the highlight protection pigmentation but not the same and not to be confused. It is good to know when your orchids were outside if there was a temperature drop at night and then you see the red tinges that you can differentiate between too much light as opposed to magnesium deficient. Bring that together and you have those reddish tinges, combine that with older leaves showing signs of mottling, light green between healthy green, you know that the red tinges are for sure not anthocyanin due to too much light, but a magnesium deficiency. So then we combine them and then we talk about CalMag. Not affiliated to this product. I have nothing going with them. I'm just here, this is the stuff that I use, and I've used for years. Usually applied in liquid form, ready to mix, with a proper balance for the orchids, so it's very simple to apply. For the layman, woman, like myself, I like using it in this format because it is convenient, and I don't have to think about the ideal ratio between the calcium and the Epsom salts. In my case, if I apply CalMag to my orchids, then CalMag it is on that day, or even double down again for next day. If I have to mix up a batch for a specific orchid more often, then I can easily do that by taking the size of the orchid into consideration. And by that, I mean, I use 100 parts per million for a small orchid and for a large orchid, 200 to 300 parts per million of CalMag. All my mounts get 100 parts per million, no matter the size of the orchid, because a larger orchid will get sprayed more often while in active growth. So in effect, it gets double or triple the dose on the day of application. Of course, you can apply calcium separately in the form of calcium nitrate, and you can apply magnesium separately in the form of Epsom salts. Know that if you apply calcium nitrate separately, it contains approximately 15% of nitrate, and adding that to your regular fertilizer will increase the amount of nitrogen when you add it. So just a little heads up here, if supplementing with calcium nitrate with your fertilizer. CalMag on the other hand, only has approximately 2% nitrate. So it is much easier to dose if you want to supplement with the fertilizer solution. Personally, I go with each element separately if a boost is needed for specific orchids. If I see a deficiency, then I am not supplementing my fertilizer solution and adding either calcium, Epsom salts, or CalMag to that. Everything, if needed, is applied in separate applications. So if an orchid is going nuts in the pot and I don't want to up my regular 200 to 300 parts per million of fertilizer, I will apply calcium nitrate at 100 parts per million all on its own. And the same 
100 parts per million of Epsom salts also on its own. And I would do those separate applications as per orchid need at a pH of 6.3 for inorganic and bare root orchids. If you're growing in organic media, as in bark, sphagnum moss, cocoa husk, anything organic, I would apply it at 6.5 pH because the minute the solution touches the organic media, there will be a drop in pH because of the acidity of the media in the pot. Now this all sounds very hoopla and very complicated. That's why I'm always very cautious about doing videos like this because it sounds like I am doing this every day separately for every orchid. That is not the case. Separate applications are very, very rare for me. I have specific orchids that need to be treated with just Epsom salts, especially my summer bloomers, as you might have seen in part of the footage here. And I do that maybe every month, maybe every second month in the growing season to be able to correct that deficiency. I have very, very rarely used calcium nitrate on its own to supplement and help an orchid along because of any kind of rot. My balanced fertilizer, I believe, takes care of that for me. So I really don't want to come across as, you need to do this once a month, you need to do this every two weeks. That is not the case. Everybody does their regimes differently. But when I speak about cow mag and seaweed, and this is what I do, how many parts per million, at what pH, these videos are gonna be my reference to what I say in other videos, and I really don't want to make it sound like this is something that has to happen often, it doesn't. And that is why I prefer to have a CalMag solution prepared and ready for me. I don't have to think twice. I don't have to worry about the imbalance. If I'm putting in too much calcium in an orchid, what will it be lacking down the line? There's always a little bit of a risk factor with doing these supplementations. But a CalMag, even though the nitrogen levels are lower, that is fine, I don't mind. And I can put it into my regular fertilizer regime if I feel the need to do so. There is no real need to do so if there is a balanced fertilizer. The reason I don't like to mix these two either in any form of application is because when you mix synthetics, even though this Epsom salts is organic, but when you start mixing things, then you can get sludge. This is calcium nitrate mixed together with Epsom salts. Prior to diluting the Epsom salts, that's another step to be mindful of if you're going to mix. How are you going to mix two things together so they don't create an unusable sludge? It's turned into jelly. And it's useless in a sprayer, in any kind of, let's say you've got a watering system, automatic watering system. And I am human, I make mistakes. And these things, for example, if you were to mix Epsom salts with calcium nitrate, all I can say is always remember to dissolve the Epsom salts first. It'll happen much faster if you pour hot water over it. Get all these granules dissolved if you want to do your CalMag application according to your PPM, as opposed to using a ready-made product. You might want to up the calcium. You might want to do a different dose of Epsom salts all in one go always dissolve your Epsom salts crystals before you mix it into anything else because the end result could look like this. And then for me, that's a waste, <laughs> waste of a good product. So I don't mix for that reason. I make mistakes and then I have to do it again. I have better control if I apply everything separately. I am also very, very wary of mixing synthetic products together. If your fertilizer is a synthetic fertilizer and not an organic fertilizer, and then you mix it with something else that is synthetic, and you get a mixture that looks like this, milky, off, and not clear, like your normal nutrient solution would be, then the products you have put in here, the nutrient solution is rendered useless. They didn't combine, they reacted against each other, and this is the result, then you know if you see this, and you've mixed two synthetics together, don't use 
that nutrient solution, and don't mix synthetics with synthetics. There are so many components in synthetic fertilizers that have a reason and have a purpose to release the nutrients in water, even slow release fertilizer will do that, even though that's in granules, but to release it in a timely manner and then at the same time it gets absorbed accordingly. When you mix synthetics together, one product has a certain kind of a release and certain component, another product has a different kind of release, a different component, and they will clash. That's just a side note. If you ever see your nutrient solution doing this, then it's probably because two synthetics did not get along well, for lack of a better term. In order for me to avoid that ever happening, I just don't mix synthetics ever. I don't mind putting seaweed into my synthetic fertilizer. For me, the equation is synthetics and organics can be mixed, but then I would use it very, very quickly, either on the same day, make a batch for the day, or maximum next day. Not because of any adverse reaction to the synthetic and the organic, but the organic will go over. So when you use any kind of organic, it's best just to make it for that day and not for storing purposes. Whereas if you use a synthetic component and you want to make a concentration of it and just use it drop wise whenever you need it, you can store that in a bottle and it'll keep for two weeks, four weeks, depending on the brand. And because of all this, I come to why I prefer to use CalMag ready-made for me. I just use the dosage I need for whatever is called for. I have the combination, I have a right balance. It, the work's been done for me. And just for plain convenience, I use this handy dandy pre-mix solution. And all I have to do is measure my pH and my parts per million. My biggest, biggest use for CalMag is for new arriving orchids. Anything that has been through stress, that can also mean an orchid that's been in my collection for three years, but suddenly is at the point of declining for a number of reasons, then I use CalMag a lot because I want the cells not to have to struggle to find magnesium from old growths. I don't want any kind of nutrition deficiency to be the cause of a stressed orchid not being able to bounce back. Calcium is important, as I mentioned earlier, because it'll only move once into the orchid and then when it's there, it'll stay in place. Ideally, many of the new orchids that we receive come with new growths, which we always like because then we know either new roots are already growing or new roots will come soon, and that will help us in adapting the orchid into our setup and our environment. And these new growths, due to stress, will need the calcium. So for arrivals or anything stressful, I always use CalMag. I've got the calcium in there, and I've got the magnesium, which is for chlorophyll production, and then the photosynth and producing the sugars for the growth. That is the reason I will always have CalMag in my welcome cocktail at 60 parts per million. I don't want to add more stress to my orchids, and these two components work really, really well in reducing the stress starting to bounce back. That is how I see it, that is why I use it, and that is why I try to keep things as separate as possible. So if this was very long-winded, I do apologize. I really, really do. I have to go a little bit of a roundabout way and sometimes I have to talk a little bit more so that I can make it understood the way I felt I needed to understand it for myself. I hope that this was useful. I hope it was helpful and please use the comments below to continue the dialogue because there are certain things that I may have missed out on because my brain is narrowed down and geared towards how I use calcium magnesium and how I separate the application of Epsom salts as opposed to calcium nitrates, very rarely mixing them. I may have a tunnel vision way of applying these products, which works for me but you may have other methods and dosages that you use. Let's continue the conversation below. I am not opposed to opposing opinions. I welcome the dialogue and I look forward to it because it opens my eyes and there are so many different ways that people do things and are successful with great results. And we can all benefit from that. And if I don't apply or take on board a suggestion or a recommendation, maybe somebody will read through the comments section 
and find what they are looking for. So I invite everybody to put in their experience regarding the application of CalMag, Epsom salt separately, calcium nitrate separately, throw it all together into one mix, all of that. And thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening to me. And once again, your time is very much appreciated. I hope to see you in the next video. Until then, stay safe and take care. Bye.